Welcome back to Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. We've been talking about the Congress in the last couple of sections, and now we're going to start diving into the presidency. But before we do that, I want to back up. In yeah. the last lesson, you talked about science and promoting useful art. Yeah. Read that clause out of the Constitution. All right, let's, uh, this is our workbook. So this is uh, promoting the progress, uh, right, is the section we want to go to. So in Article 1, Section 8, to, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Now, that's an interesting clause. If I tell you the word Noah Webster or Webster, what do you think of? The dictionary. Exactly. Yes. You don't think of a founding father. Noah Webster is responsible for that clause in the Constitution. So he actually had influence on the Constitution. He had huge influence. As a matter of fact, he's the second guy in America to call for the Constitutional Convention. Pelletier Webster was first, Noah Webster was second. Really? And he's the second guy to call for it, and then he did that in 1785. Then they assembled 1787 do it. He has direct influence. He met with all sorts of the delegates, met with George Washington, had dinner with him, all these different guys. He was like a lobbyist. He, he was like the, a lobbyist. A lobbyist for the Constitution. Now, he wasn't a scientist, was he? I don't know much about the things a that he did. No, he? Webster actually was a scientist. Was he? I mean, he is, he's probably one of the top three educators in American history. And his deal was, all right, now that we've separated from Great Britain, if we don't educate American-wise, we're going to still think like British citizens because what happened, we were still importing textbooks from Great Britain. And so our literature books, our grammar books, our spelling books, our history books, our government books all come from Great Britain. He said, no, we'll start thinking like British people rather yeah. than Americans. So he called for a revolution in education to match the revolution we'd had in our forms of government. Yeah. And so he starts writing textbooks like crazy. And he's writing textbooks. And, and so he's very active as a founding father himself. He was a soldier in the revolution. Uh, he was a legislator. He was a judge. Actually, it was a legislator in two states after the revolution judge. So he's very much politically involved, but he understands how important education is. He wrote textbooks on meteorology, on animal husbandry, on economics, one of the best economic books out there Noah Webster did, on medicine, one of the best layman's medicine wow. books ever done. Uh, he wrote books on, on science, on government, on you name the subject. I mean, he probably wrote more textbooks than anybody in America on every area. So he and, understood the importance of protecting your creation what you've written, That's what you've put on the market. And by the way, after the Constitutional Convention was over, the Founding Fathers went to him and asked him to promote it and write pieces, and so he did. He's a big, big read, kind of like the Federalist Papers. He writes these pieces that went across the nation, were highly read by people, and why they should ratify the Constitution. No kidding, I didn't know that. So he, he, right, he, cool. he's a big influence. But that part right there is the result of this book right here. Now this, I don't know if this is going to be good news or bad news. This is a spelling book. He came out with a spelling book in 1782. One his, his creations. No Webster okay. spelling book. And remember, he wants this to be different from the British. So until this book came out in 1782, there was not a right way or a wrong way to spell a word in America. And that's why folks like John Trumbull, colonial governor, spelled his own last name six different ways. <laughs> I, I have letters here, Rick, in this library. And if you'll read them phonetically, you say, that guy's from Georgia. Oh, he's from Boston. Because you, These were his own way of, he spelled it different well, ways. Well, everybody did in America. Yeah. So I, I've got a letter over there where it talks about D-A-A-W-G. Oh, dog. <laughs> and, and if you can read it yeah. that way. Yeah. And so I got letters from John Jay, the, the Chief Justice, that are very much on the main Boston kind of accent side. They had R's after their A's and the words they drop A's out. They pock the con, the yod. Wow. So you can literally read it. And he's the guy who came out and said, no, no, no. And, and he, I, can't, I can't imagine. I'm sorry. I was just thinking about him writing from, you know, from Virginia to, to Boston or wherever. And the difference in those letters, even in the committees of correspondence. I never thought about yeah, that, uh, so there was probably... There a, was no standard for spelling yeah. until this comes out. And then he says, and we're not spelling it the way the British do. And so the British, when they spell labor, L-A-B-O-U-R, he yeah. dropped out all, all the U's out of words, and, and favor, F-A-B-O-U-R. So th this is the deal. But now, this is his creation. You can't get a copyrighted in America because we're 13 states, and you've got to go to every He's state. You've got to go to each one. You've yeah. got to go to every state. So I can get this copyrighted in Massachusetts, but North Carolina doesn't like me. Or I can get this copyrighted up in Vermont, but you know what? New York doesn't like and, and so how do you protect your creation? This is your property. Founding Fathers taught that you this this type yeah. of stuff, your your intellectual property is as much your property as your real estate, as much as your money, anything else. And so he's the guy who got that part added that and again, read it again. Listen to what and, and think about this. this and he way. must have he must have thought that the Commerce Clause alone was not enough. So the Commerce Clause was to make sure that all thirteen mm -hmm states, you know, that you had that free but that flow doesn't of give commerce, you protection. but it doesn't protect that It lets that, him sell his books everywhere, yeah. but it doesn't protect his property. So this was specifically to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing, That's so you're it. protecting that property, 
for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So he wasn't asking, like we talked about in that last chapter, he wasn't asking Congress or the federal government to pay for it. No. He wasn't asking for them to... Protect my private Yeah, just property. protect it. Don't, don't promote it by spending money to promote it. Just protect it That's right. when somebody else tries I'll to I'll promote it. I'll it. buy the ads in the newspaper. we got newspapers in here that, where he's selling this where book. Where he's actually advertising yeah, this selling book. Wow. He'll, he'll buy the ads, etc. And this did real well. More than 100 million copies over the life of, from 1782 to 1932. But he promoted himself, copies. 100 wow. million copies. That's how come, and I don't know, uh, maybe he's a hero, maybe he's a heel. If you don't like spelling, he's, he's right. a heel. If you right. like spelling, <laughs> but he, well, he's the guy. I just appreciate, you know, one time we did a television show together and, and you broke out some uh, spelling tests oh. from back then and made me try to spell them on. So I just want to thank you for not doing that here. Well, no, I'm not even going to try. You, I, I could let you try some of these I spelling should words. Test you. This and, and, and by the way, this is an elementary spelling book. It's embarrassing. Yeah. I don't even try to pronounce I can't pronounce words. them, let alone That's right. spell them. That's no right. doubt about it. It's no question. So, All right. Great point, though, because, that, again, it's back to the original intent. It is. Because I didn't even know that that was the origin of it. I didn't know who it was, and I didn't know that it was, for him, it was specifically dealing with authorship mm -hmm. and, and books. But I'm sure he and Franklin, I can only imagine, they had to have discussions about science as well. Well, and you so bet. What a great, yeah. And, but, you know, it's interesting. Franklin... Uh, the Founding Fathers had an attitude that you serve, and therefore they, they believed that if someone came to you and said, you've got to run for office, you're not allowed to say no because that's selfish. Wow. If they recognize that you're a leader and say, I want you in the legislature, you, if you say, no, I've got, I've got to spend time with my family or my job, or, that's being selfish. Wow. And so Benjamin Rush specifically quotes Romans 14:7 out of the Bible to say, no man lives and dies to himself. It's not your choice. You're here to serve other people. Yeah. And, and so that was their belief. And so Franklin, with all his inventions, never patented a single one. Wow. Because he believed that they all belonged to the public. He wanted to do it to help people. And so, I, I mean, you know, he could have been wealthy in a lot of ways. No, he invented all these cool things and didn't patent any. But others did. It's yeah. a private property. They have and the so right he to do obviously that. supported he protecting supported their that. property. He's, at the, he's yeah. at the convention, and, you know, and he supports Webster. Webster met with Franklin, and yeah. Franklin and Webster had discussions on spelling and other books. So uh, it's part of it. And the other thing from, from the, the last lesson that Scott, we talked about duty. And, you know, yeah. the, the question was, well, if God's in charge of everything, why do we need to get involved? And, and there's a really cool thing that I thought of that I pulled out. This is an election sermon, and probably folks don't know what an election sermon is. Yeah, we we but, don't get many of those anymore. And we think of the sermon on election, but not really. Hmm. For 170 years, this is a sermon that was preached in front. We started state legislative assemblies by having a joint session of the legislature, House and the Senate, Governor, Lieutenant, Governor, Governor, and a minister preach a sermon to them. Oh, so this is after the election. This is after so the this election. So is, this is not a sermon about the election coming up. This is after the election. This is after the election. Having a sermon with those who actually got elected. That's right. Ah. And so this happened in Hartford. So this is Connecticut. Matthias Burnett is the guy who did the sermon. In 1801, my recollection, I think the governor at that time was John Trumbull. Hmm. And he was one of Washington's aide de camps in the revolution. So we have some John Trumbull stuff He's back there. He's got a statue at the Capitol, right? Well, no, it's his dad that's got a statue. Oh, that's his dad. He's the son. So the other Jonathan. His all dad, these Jonathan Troubles, I get confused. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like George Foreman. Right. You know? <laughs> all of his kids were named John. <laughs> so John Trumbull. That's right. John. Yeah. So, so what you have is in this sermon, and, and, and he, he talks to the legislators about the issues they're facing because the Bible gives guidance on every issue, economic issue, education, military, whatever. And he gets done with that, and then he looks up to all the citizens sitting in the balcony because this is all the new elected officials down here. And so there's citizens just filling the, the gallery up there. And what he says to them I, I find really profound. He's, now he's talking to the citizens, and he said, to God and posterity, you're accountable for your rights and your rulers. Now, a whole lot of Americans, they say, whoa, don't you blame those rulers on me? I didn't even vote last election. Exactly. exactly. No doubt. He said, you yeah. will answer to God for these rulers right here, and you will answer to your kids as well. That's what I was going to say. Posterity is not a word that's used very often. No. He's saying you're actually responsible for the current leaders because the future generations are going to pay the price for yeah. what you elect. Now, this goes to eschatology, and it, it deals with uh, uh, people of faith understand this. It's a view of what they think is going to happen in the last days. Yeah. And so, you know, if they think Christ is going to return in the last days, whatever, they're just sitting around, too many are just sitting around waiting for that. The point with that is, you know what, regardless of what eschatology you hold, you're still told specifically in the scriptures, Luke 19, 13, Jesus said, you occupy till I come. So the stewardship was there. If you, if you think Christ is going to return today, great, but you'd be a steward till that time. So yeah. there's no checking out and saying, I don't have a duty. I'm, I'm waiting for Whether it's tomorrow or 50 it years doesn't from matter. now, today I do my duty. And that's why, and these guys believe that. They, they definitely believe theologically Christ's return, but they also believe that if he didn't come when I want to, what I would do with posterity. And so that's why I said to God and posterity, you're accountable for your righteousness. Let's say 
that, that the end doesn't come when I think it's going to come. And so far, every generation since Christ was here thought it'd be in their generation. Right, they've right. all been wrong. Yeah. He, he, says, he says, let not your children have reason to curse you for giving up those rights and prostrating those institutions which your fathers delivered to you as a sacred palladium and which, by the blessing of God, have been peculiarly beneficial to your order, peace, and stability. He said, you'll answer to God, but you'll also answer to the next generation. Don't let them curse you for having given up all these great rights we mm -hmm. were entrusted. And, and that's the founding fathers believe that. John Adams, he said, posterity, you'll never know how much it cost my generation to preserve your freedom. Don't make me repent in heaven that I did what I did. You know, wow. it's like, don't, don't you make me sorry that I, that I worked so hard to give you something. That's a serious, I started to say burden, because, but it is. It, should it is. Be, it, it we should, should be a burden. We should see that and say, hey, I, I really, got, I've got a duty here that I need to be thinking about. I need to be investing in. So if you're going to do that right, That's if, right. if you're going to really do your children right and grandchildren right, you've got to spend a little bit of time so while we're studying all these things, but then study the candidates, know how they measure to these That's things. That's right. Invest in these things and, and fulfill that and, responsibility. You know, studying the candidates probably would take you a good 15 minutes yeah, it's not, every take two years. There's plenty of tools out there I don't know if now. I've got 15 minutes yeah. to look at a voter's guide or search the internet or... You know, that's just too much time. And see, that's the attitude that's going to keep us in trouble. It is. And if we don't get an attitude that says, you know what, it may take me two hours, but that's better than watching a TV program for two hours if I can save my country. Yeah. And, and that's the attitude Absolutely. we're going to have to And ten years ago, it was even more difficult because you didn't have as many voter guides. That's there right. weren't all these groups out there doing the research. That's right. Today, it's you can a, spend 15 no minutes on the Internet, find those voter guides, look at all those candidates. Well, one of those areas that we need to hold accountable is the president. So every four years, we choose a president. And we're going to choose someone that's going to have an impact on, right. on us in so many different ways. So let's get into that area of the, of the presidency. Let's go back to what we saw earlier, and, and that is, and look at how the Constitution is laid out, Article 1, 2, and 3. Kind of taking that step back again step to see back. how the presidency the, fits into the whole that's thing. That's right. Okay. That's the second most important area. Congress is, is number one area. President's number two. And probably the most significant part of the presidential responsibilities is in Article 2 where it says to take care that the law shall be faithfully executed. Yeah. That's why he's called the executive branch. He e executes the law. So the laws that have been passed by Congress and signed by the President for however many years, his purpose is to execute those laws. Now, when we do that, John Adams says when you execute the laws as passed constitutionally, he had a great quote, he said we're a government of laws and not of men. It doesn't matter who gets in office because you're bound by the laws that are there. But knowing human nature as they did, and the way they set up guards against it, they also pointed out that it's going to be really easy for somebody to get in and try to run their own agenda through the executive branch. Yeah. And, and so he talked about it. This is what he said. He said, the interest of the people is one thing. It is the public interest. In other words, for the people, they want what's good for the people. They, they're not interested in agendas of different groups. The, the people have a public interest. He said, and where the public interest governs, it's a government of laws and not of men. When you're looking out for the good of the people themselves, You'll do what the laws say, not, not what you yourself say. You may have a different agenda. You may get elected on an agenda. But when you're looking out for the good of the people, you're going to uphold the laws that the people's representatives that they chose have passed, whether, it's, whether you agree with the law or not. Yeah. So, that, so that's, let me read again. The interest of the people is one thing. It's the public interest. And, when the public, and where the public interest governs, it's a government of laws and not of men. But he said, however, the interest of a king or a party or a president is another thing. It is a private interest. And where private interest governs, it's a government of men and not of laws. Mm. If you elect a president who says, I'm going to take my pen and just rewrite what I want through executive orders, I'm going to use agencies to get what I want. I've got an agenda, I was elected with an agenda, and I'm going to cram that agenda through. It's no longer a government of laws, it's now a government of men. Because that man is the small end of the funnel, he is deciding everything that the people need. It's not what the representatives say they need, I'll tell you what they yeah. need. And that's ignoring the that's laws That's ignoring themselves. the laws. Yeah. And so that's why the most important responsibility for any president is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. He's the, he's the guardian. He has a trust from previous generations. All the laws they passed, the War Powers Act goes back in the 1930s, but you know what? It's still on the books. And that means all the people for the last 70, 80 years want that law there. And so we, he keeps enforcing it because that may not be what he personally wants. That's what America has wanted and kept for 80 years. And so whatever the law is, he's got to uphold that law. And I guess it applies to the Constitution itself as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's still the, the laws of the people. That's, and absolutely. that's what we've put in place. So he has to faithfully execute the laws. As, as the Constitution says that it should be That's done. That's right. right? And, and I may not like freedom of the press if they attack me, but it doesn't matter. I've yeah. still got to uphold it. You yeah. know, I may not like freedom of conscience if you do something I don't agree with. That's all right. I've still got to uphold it. 
And so that's what you look for in your public officials, people who put themselves to the side and say, I'm not the most important thing, you guys are. And this is what you've said, you've spoken with a collective voice, and I'm going to enforce your will. Now, there are occasions where that one thing here or one thing there you may have a conscience problem with. You know, Abraham Lincoln ignored the Supreme Court and Dred Scott decision because he did declare freedom for slaves in Washington, D.C., and the Supreme Court said you can't do that. Uh, you certainly have Thomas Jefferson with the Alien Sedition Act, said that's an absolutely bad law. I'm going to release everyone that was convicted under it, and they eventually repealed the law. Yeah, but, but he did it in a constitutional way right. by pardoning or commuting. Them. That's yeah. right. He, he did yeah. it the right way, and he wasn't going in with his own agenda. Yeah. And, and so when you go in with your own agenda and say, I'm going to use all these agencies, and I'm going to use every tool I have to get done what I want, now you, so what you want is a government of laws, not of men, and that's where the president comes in. He'll be the one, more than any other entity in government, to decide whether it's a government of laws or a government of men by what he chooses to enforce and not enforce. So to choose those presidents wisely, we've got to know what their proper role is and how they should be following the Constitution and what they do. That's how we can hold them accountable. So to learn more about Article II in the presidency, we're going to go back out to Philadelphia at Independence Hall. Welcome back to Constitutional Live. We're going to do a quick review of what we covered last night. We had a great time here at Independence Hall. Wonderful class here with us. We covered a lot of ground. So I just want to do a quick review of what we did last night, and then we'll jump into our new section. Of course, last night we talked about our purpose, what this class is all about. We're the quick start guide to the Constitution. We're not doing the year-long class. We're not doing the three-year law degree. We're just doing the quick start guide so that we know where to plug things in. We know how to be active as citizens to participate in our government. So we went through a quote by this guy. Who remembers who we were talking about? Who's this guy on the screen? Help me out. Anybody? I heard, I heard it in the back. You got it. John Jay, exactly. First Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, one of those authors of the Federalist Papers. And here's the quote that drove everything we did last night, and it will again tonight as well. He said, every member of the state, so that's all of us, ought diligently to read and to study. Again, remind, remember that what we talked about was the study part means we're going to crack open the minds of the founding fathers. We're going to get inside there and find out what were they thinking, what did they intend, what were these guys actually trying to do with the words they put into the Declaration and the Constitution. So read and study the Constitution, and then teach the rising generation to be free. I love that phrase, that, that, that idea of passing the torch of freedom to the next generation, making sure that they get it as well. It's not enough for us to study it. We've got to pass it intact to the next generation. By knowing their rights, they'll sooner perceive when they've been violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. So our purpose is to know our rights, know what these guys were putting in place for us, and then know how we're to constitutionally properly defend and assert them. That will drive everything that we do. And so we spent a little time last night talking about the seeds of liberty, what these guys in this room actually put into those documents that caused us to be the most successful nation in history. I told you last night coming in here reminds me of National Treasures and, and Nicolas Cage coming in here and finding the, the glasses and the secret message on the back of the Declaration. And obviously we're not going to have anything like that happen, but we are going to be reminded and restore that message on the front side of the Declaration and the Constitution. Those words given to the world really defining our secret sauce, our formula for the future of our nation. And it worked incredibly well. The seeds that they planted gave us the most successful nation ever. We talked, or at least the, the kids came up and explained those four principles out of the Declaration. The idea that there are truths, there are concepts of right and wrong, that these guys were willing to pledge their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. They wouldn't do that for just anything. They did it because they believed in right and wrong, moral absolutes, and a set of values, a set of ideas that was worth fighting and dying for. And I mentioned last night that quote from George Washington. It comes from this speech right here. It's his farewell address. This is actually a, a 1796 printing of that address. It's an old, old book. And I want to just read directly out of the book for you if I can. It's tough, that old English and the way they did the S's and all that, but let's see if I can get it right for you. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. The firmest props of the duties of men and citizens, the mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and cherish them. A volume could not trace all their connections with private and public felicity. In other words, he was saying that religion and morality were connected to both our private happiness and our public happiness. For our nation to be successful, it was connected to that. 
Let it be firmly asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths, which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice? He's saying if you don't have that, that private expectation that I'm going to be held accountable to a higher being, then when you take an oath in court, for instance, you got no reason to tell the truth. Why would you tell the truth if nobody else there would know? That oath means nothing without that belief in God, without that belief that there's somebody that's going to hold me accountable outside of just this group in the room. So he goes on to talk about the importance in religion and education. I just think it's so neat to bring these guys, bring their actual words from over 200 years ago and be reminded of what they gave us. We also talked about the fact that they did believe that there was a higher being, that that's the source of our freedom, that we don't give it to each other, that we don't get it from government, it comes from God, and therefore government can't take it away. We can't take it from each other. Very important concept. And then we talk about the consent of the governed, the idea that the only just power of government comes from us. It comes from you. It comes from me. We've got to be engaged giving or refusing that consent. And lastly, uh, Rhett talked about the pursuit of happiness, that free enterprise system that's so important to our system of government. Then we went into kind of stepping back and saying, what's the 30,000 feet view? And you remember how quickly we, we flew through the entire Constitution just to get a big picture of what it's all about. We covered the seven articles. We covered the 27 amendments, and we just flew all, through all of them, skipped over the Bill of Rights, which we'll get to tonight, but it gave us a big picture. And then we zoomed in, in the last part of our class, to the enumerated powers of Congress, what the dues of Congress actually are. And we found those in Article 1, Section 8, and spent our time on Article 1, Section 8 to identify those important dues of Congress, those enumerated powers. Tonight, what we want to do is we want to dive in now to Article 2. We want to step in and see what was the executive branch designed to do? What's the proper function of the presidency in our nation? We're not going to be able to cover every little thing in our quick start guide, so I've tried to pick out some of the hot topics, if you will, or the things that have been in the news lately and the things that we're most concerned about with regard to the executive branch. So we're going to jump into the presidency and a lot of things we could talk about. Not going to go through much of the details in terms of two terms and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the age requirements and that sort of thing. I want to jump right into the Electoral College first because this is an idea that, that really encapsulated what these men thought was important, as we said last night, for our special form of a republic, for our kind of federalism. We wanted representation at the federal level for the people and for the states. And that's why the House was elected by the people and the Senate by the state legislatures until we changed that with the 17th. But the Electoral College was still a way for both the people to have a voice and the states to have a voice. You and I, we get to vote for president, but then our vote is cast with our state. So we get our individual vote within our state, and then our state cast its votes together within the Electoral College. So here's a couple of maps that give you an idea of that. The 2004 election, you see the red states and blue states. That's a breakdown of how the states voted for president. Then the 2008 results. That was actually the first time, by the way, that we had a state split their vote. Uh, it was Nebraska. You had actually one district in, in Nebraska. Maine and Nebraska are the only ones that have it in, their, uh, in their, uh, their state requirements for how they choose their electors. They can actually split their vote. But this was the first time that it happened. One, one district actually went to President Obama and the, all, the, all four of the other uh, delegates for Nebraska went to uh, John McCain. But, but what these guys did, when they gathered in here, they really had a hard time initially deciding how they wanted to set up the presidency. Uh, they, they, they looked at a lot of different options. They actually had a committee of 11 guys that debated, okay, should we have, for instance, the Congress choose the president, sort of a parliamentary system like a, a lot of nations in Europe. They said, no, that's a bad idea because we've seen what happens and you, then you kind of hold the, um, the, the, the president is held to just those folks that elected him out of Congress. He kind of feels like he's beholden to those guys and they get special favors back and forth. They just didn't like that idea. So they said, well, how about direct election by the people? And they said, no, we don't like that idea because you'll have the most populated areas outvoting the more rural areas and you'll have regions of the nation um, going against other regions of the nation. They said, well, why don't we have the states choose? You used to have 13 votes and the states choose. They said, no, same problem. You got certain regions of the, of the nation or you'll have the small states ganging up against the big states. It just won't work. So they came up with a brilliant idea, the Electoral College. They combined all three of those things. They said, actually, what we'll do is we'll let the people have a voice. Then it'll be within the states. And if no one wins a majority of the Electoral College, then it goes to Congress, and Congress gets to decide at that point, which has actually happened before. It happened with John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, who was in here uh, for the Declaration. But here's what they really, the, the, the concept behind the compromise that they made with those three things. They said, we want two things to occur. We believe that our executive, our president, 
should, should have two things. That, that a, a president should have a sufficient vote of the people, not necessarily the, the, the majority of individual votes, but a sufficient vote, meaning real close, if not the most, and also a sufficient distribution of that vote. So not just have a lot of votes, but have those votes spread across the nation. And that's how the Electoral College sort of encompasses those two requirements. And probably the closest thing to that that we've seen in our, our lifetime anyway was, of course, the 2000 race, where you had two candidates that got very, very close on the popular vote, on the number of individual votes, with Al Gore edging out George Bush on the number of votes. But they both had a sufficient number of votes. Bush had more of a distribution of the votes. If you just look at the map there with the red and the blue, clearly his vote was distributed more across the nation, so he edged out just barely in the Electoral College. That's not the first time. We've had four times where the president lost the popular vote but won the Electoral College or was chosen by Congress. So this balance that they gave has actually served us really well. The Electoral College has been a, a great tool for us as a nation. And I like the way Benjamin Rush describes why they thought it was so important not to have just a popular vote in terms of the, uh, your, your big cities being the ones to choose. Because think about it, I mean, if you had just a popular vote and not an electoral college, who's going to be the major deciders for who's going to be president? Big, uh, well, your big cities, even in the state. So you're going to have Houston and, and, and Philadelphia and, and Los Angeles and New York, and, and that's going to be where the vast majority, that's the only places the president's going to campaign. That's going to be where your presidential elections really take place. Here's what Benjamin Rush, now, now Rush was a, a great founding father. He's one of the guys that sat here and gave us our Declaration of Independence. He was a medical doctor, trained about 2,000 doctors, just an incredible guy, real renaissance man, did a lot of amazing things. But I love the way he says this, and you'll just have to forgive the description that he uses. He's a medical doctor, all right? And you'll recognize why I'm saying that in a second. He said, I view great cities as pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. This is in a letter to Thomas Jefferson. He tells Jefferson, he says, I agree with you in your opinion of cities. Cowper the poet very happily expresses our ideas of them compared with the country. God made the country, man made the cities. <laughs> I consider them in the same light that I do abscesses on the human body as reservoirs of all the impurities of the community. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you think about that, now I'm a country boy, so I get a good kick out of that, all right? But even if you're a city boy, all right, think about it. What he's saying is, remember, these guys were really into understanding the nature of man and they understood the depravity of man, that just the nature of man, they're going to do bad things. And if you have a, a lot of people congregated together, you're going to get more bad things. It's just the nature of man. So they said, we don't want those great cities to be making the decision. We want it to be spread all across the nation. So now, though, there's a movement to reverse what these guys did. It's called the National Popular Vote Movement. And what they're doing is they're using this Article 2, Section 1 language. And you can actually turn to that in page 18 of your Constitution Made Easy. And, and what they're doing is they're saying, look, it, it says that any state can, can choose their electors any way that they want. And you see the language there. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors and goes on to describe. And, and that's true. The, the state gets to choose how they're going to choose the electors. I cannot possibly imagine that these men would have ever thought that the choice that a state would make would be to not choose because that's what national popular vote does. If a state adopts national popular vote, what, it, what they say is, no matter what the people in our state choose, if another candidate gets the popular vote in the nation, our electoral college votes go to that person. So in other words, if you think back to that map that I showed earlier, if you, if you take my home state of, of Texas, and the, in the 2008 election went for McCain, but if we had adopted national popular vote, our electoral college votes would have gone to Obama. You, you think of a state like California that clearly supported President Obama. Their electoral college, had, had McCain gotten the popular vote, their electoral college votes would have been taken away from Obama and given to McCain. So it really is, I think, a very bad idea that's going to become very unpopular once it actually kicks in, if it kicks in. And, and it will kick in once enough states adopt this law that the total of the states that have adopted it is more than 270, because that's the magic number in the electoral college to win the presidency. So let's look at why they're doing it. This is a, an assemblyman up in, in New York. This is actually a Republican assemblyman. He said, the Electoral College is an 18th century anachronism that no longer serves the goals of a pure democracy. Hmm, do we want a pure democracy? Anybody in here want a pure democracy? Do you think any of these guys wanted a pure democracy? Absolutely not. They were incredibly outspoken against a pure democracy. In fact, that phrase is used by John Witherspoon. I mean, Witherspoon sat here and was a very influential man on the Founding Fathers, gave us the Declaration of Independence, trained a lot of these guys. 
Witherspoon said this about pure democracy. Pure democracy cannot subsist long, nor be carried far into the Department of State. It is very subject to caprice and the madness of popular rage. The madness of popular rage. Here's John Adams. Remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. And then back to Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush says it best. He says, a simple democracy is one of the greatest of evils. A democracy is a mobocracy. They didn't want a democracy. It drives me nuts when a lot of my friends in the political realm talk about, we're for democracy, we want democracy. That word, certainly as understood by these guys, was very different from a republic. They did not want a democracy. In fact, Article 4, Section 4 of our Constitution guarantees we're going to be a republic and that every state is going to be guaranteed to be a republic. Take a look at that slide there. That's the states that have already adopted national popular vote. If you add up their electoral college votes, we're halfway there to getting rid of the electoral college. That's 132. And it's probably going to be adopted by New York. It's, there's several states that are seriously considering it right now. I personally think the momentum is against what I prefer, which is what these guys prefer, the Electoral College. National popular vote is gaining steam in the nation. And the reason, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's actually the arguments for them are quite simple. Shouldn't the person with the most votes win? And that sounds great if you don't understand federalism, if you don't understand a republic, if you don't understand the idea of the states having a voice and all the things we just talked about with the founders. Unfortunately, in one line you can tell their side of the story. How long did it take me to go through and explain the, va the value of having an electoral college? So it's harder for us. That's why we have to educate people about what these guys were thinking, what the purpose of the electoral college was, and why it's been good for us as a nation. I, I, I do think we can turn the tide on this. I think it's something that just requires education. The fact that you know, we've had 5,000 people go through this class already. Uh, the, I think if, if we get enough people studying the Constitution, studying the or, or original ideas, we can win that battle, but it's going to take a lot of work. You guys are from all over the country. I challenge you to go home to your state, find out if there's a bill being considered in the legislature to abolish the Electoral College or adopt the national popular vote and lobby against it. I encourage you to do that and, and protect the constitutional idea that these guys put into our original document. So that's the Electoral College. You guys got any question on that one before I move on to the next part of the presidency? This is from uh, Sabrina in Michigan. It's more of a general question, but she asks, well, with the emphasis on the oath of office is huge for the founders, how do we emphasize the importance of the oath of office for the legislature, presidential, and judiciary? How do we enforce or encourage enforcement? Mm, great question. So a question for Michigan was, how, if, if the oath of office was so important to these guys, and they talked about the meaning behind it and why it meant that you were accountable to someone besides those in the room, how do we, I, I guess if I could rephrase what she said, re-emphasize that today, how do we get back to that idea so that when people take an oath as a legislator, for instance, or as a judge, that they again take that oath very seriously and they um, are, are true to that oath. And because if you think about it, if you get elected to the legislature, for instance, most of what you do is not in the public eye. Most votes are not record votes. Most deals, if you will, are made behind the scenes. Most of the activity happens in committee. All that stuff's going on behind the scenes. That's why the founders were so big on the idea that you've got to vote for honest people. You've got to vote for people of integrity that you can trust because you're not going to be able to hold them accountable in everything that they do. Now, yes, you get that voting record that's on the, that, where they do keep the voting record. You can hold them accountable in that way, but it's limited. And so honesty and integrity was a big deal. So if you elect people that are honest and have integrity, then that oath is going to be very important to them. When they take that oath, they're going to want to uphold the Constitution. They're going to want to uphold that oath. And I think the answer to the question is the way you get those running for office to take it seriously when they win is for we the people to demand it of them. Remember what we said about consent of the governed. The only just power of government comes from us. So if we will talk about the oath, I, I think it's a great idea to take the oath of office and give it to a candidate and say, I want you to tell me how I'm going to know if you're upholding this oath so that they'll begin to think about it before they even get it in there. I think most people that run for office today they want to uphold the oath. They want to do a good job. I, I think uh, sometimes we think the worst of everybody just because they're running for office. I get to visit with a lot of people that are in office or running for office, and most of them want to do a good job. A lot of times they end up voting that, things that, that I would argue are unconstitutional just because they don't know. So we're doing the most important part right now. We're getting educated. Now it's our job to go back and help get them educated and choose leaders that will take that oath seriously. Yes, ma'am. January 3rd. 2011, they, they read the Constitution. They did, on the, yes. Why? It was great. In fact, she's talking about at the opening of the congressional session in 2011. 
we actually helped um, with make, making this happen. We were pushing for a little bit more stringent rules um, for the house whenever the, the new leadership came into the house. We wanted them to require, and they actually did require, a constitutional provision to be pointed out in every bill that was um, offered in the legislature. You had to say where in the Constitution you had the power as a member of Congress to offer this piece of legislation, uh, which we thought was great and, and I think is a very bold step in the right direction. What we wanted, though, was for all those loopholes we talked about last night to be excluded. We, we actually had in, in the drafts that we gave to the Speaker's office, we said you should exclude necessary and proper clause, commerce clause, and general welfare and not let them use those loopholes because, as you know, most of the time when somebody turns in their bill, they're going to have, oh, well, general welfare gives me the power to do this. But it, it, as a part of those new rules that they had adopted, they did the reading of the Constitution from the House floor. And it was so interesting. At first, a lot of the people that aren't real you know, pro-founding fathers, pro-Constitution, were objecting and saying, oh, this is just for show. But as soon as they said, we're going to do it, every member of Congress said, I want to be part of that. I want to, I want to read. I want to read. Because they knew. We, the people, we love our Constitution. We love our founding fathers. And we, we, we wouldn't have liked it if they just said they didn't want to participate. So it was a very positive thing. It started bringing awareness, I think, to those members of Congress and to the nation that we are governed by that document, that that document is important, that every piece of legislation should have to abide by that document. And I think it's going to help to, to, to have that rule in there because at least what it does, it requires a member to put their provision, you know, point to their provision in the Constitution. And then if it's a, you know, if it's a weak provision like these, these loopholes, at least it opens the door for other members of Congress to debate that with them and to raise it. You've got a big, you've got a pretty large constitutional caucus now in Congress that really wants to adhere to that strict constructionist viewpoint, and, and they're starting to educate their colleagues. So it's a long process, but that was a huge step in the right direction. I'm glad you raised it, because I think it was a very, very positive thing. Yes, sir? Going back to that national popular vote yeah. and the pure democracy part, it seems as if we went to that, that we would essence be a pure democracy Yes. versus the Republican Article 4, Section 4. What, We'd happened, be a lot closer. what happens to Article 4, Section 4? Yeah, it, we'd be a lot closer. Uh, I, I don't think we would be a pure democracy yet because you still have the congressional side of things. Um, but but it, 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 yeah, there's not, there's not much left. And no, you know what? Actually, you're probably right because now that we don't choose our senators by, um, through the state legislature, we've gone to that almost pure democracy. Now, pure democracy would be where we would be voting on every issue. We wouldn't even have those representatives. So it, I, it, in my mind, I, I think of it as a sliding scale for, between democracy and republic. We got rid of election of senators through the legislature. We moved a little bit closer to democracy. You get rid of the Electoral College, you move a lot closer to democracy. So it's definitely a step in the wrong direction in my book. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, going back to the oath, so if they go ahead and they vote and they're not following their oath at all, what should take place? The challenge is that because we're so uneducated today in America about what the Constitution's all about and what the oath really stands for and whether or not something they're doing is unconstitutional, they're going to make a, what it sounds like a sound argument to most people that what they're doing is not a violation of their oath. So it's going to be a debate over whether or not they've upheld the Constitution. It's probably a losing debate. So it's, hard, it's better for us to choose people that share your view. You want to vote for someone that shares your view of the Constitution so that their view of the oath is the same as what your view is. Does that make sense? I think they're going to negate uh, our argument that they have violated their oath by not upholding the Constitution, which in some cases it's pretty easy. I mean, we have a lot of politicians today, you've got the sound bites where they say, Constitution, what does that matter? You know, or why should I take the Constitution into consideration on this? So, I mean, that's a pretty obvious one that you ought to be able to say, well, you're, now you're violating your oath because your oath requires you to uphold the Constitution. But most times they're not foolish enough to actually say that. They, they just take actions that don't reflect that they respect the Constitution. All right, let's jump over to the 25th Amendment. So we got two sections out of here that I want to point out. One is the opportunity for the president to say, I cannot fulfill the duties, and so they pass the torch, if you will, to the vice president and invoke the 25th. They choose, the president chooses to invoke the 25th. That's section three of the 25th Amendment. Section four is when the vice president and the cabinet invoke the 25th, so they have to decide that they think the president is incapacitated, cannot fulfill the duties, and they have to vote to do that. Now, speaking of Section 4 and the, the Cabinet and the Vice President choosing to do that, who can tell me when was the first time in, in America, in the United States, that the 25th was invoked under Section 4, where the Vice President and the Cabinet did that? Who might remember when that was? 
Anybody? Just guess. Just, just throw out names. Let's see if. Which one? Lincoln. Lincoln. Nope. Reagan. Wilson, Reagan, nope. Bush. Bush, no. I was gonna say Bush. You were going to say Bush, too? We got two Bushies. Well, actually, there's two Bushes. So you could have been the first one, you could have been the second one. 1963. 63, so it would have been when Kennedy, Kennedy. was shot. And it, nope. Reagan. Reagan. No, these are good guesses, though. Okay, I'm just going to give it to you. It's actually President David Palmer in season two of 24. That was the, uh, that was the first time. And, and you remember what happened. See, the, the, the vice president didn't like what he was doing, and so he got half the cabinet to vote with him. Then there was a big debate over whether one of the members of the cabinet had already resigned, and that changed the vote because it was such... It was a great episode, all right? But it, you know why it was so great? Because it educated us on the 25th Amendment. They did a great job of actually doing it right. They actually got the 25th Amendment out. They read it on the show. It was fantastic. But it did happen again, actually. It happened in uh, season four with President Logan. <laughs> that was the next time. And President Logan, man, I mean, the slimiest president in American history, I'm telling you, if you watch 24 at all, this guy was awful. So it gets invoked in, in season four. And then again in season six, a third time, when uh, Wayne Palmer was president of the United States and the thing blew up next to his uh, podium and he got injured and they invoked the tw Anyway, so all, those were the three times that it was invoked. And, Air uh, Force One. Uh, say that again? Air oh, Force in the movie one. Air Force One. That's another good one. That's right. Forgot about that one. Okay, so here in the real world, it's never happened. So it, it, it hasn't ha It came close. Now, when Reagan and y'all guessed Reagan, that was the closest we ever came. It was, uh, it was Bush, uh, George H.W., uh, he was actually on his way back to D.C. So Reagan got shot. This was 81. He gets shot. He's already in surgery. Bush is on his way to Texas. They get word to him. They turn the plane around. They head back to D.C. When he lands in D.C., uh, they tell him Reagan's only going to be out for another hour, only under anesthesia for another hour. I thought Bush did a very statesmanlike thing. He had a big press conference. He said, we are not invoking the 25th. The president's going to be fine. America's going to be fine. He calmed everybody down, calmed America down, calmed the reporters down, calmed the world down. Call them the chaos back in the, in the uh, situation room down. We won't get into all that. But it, fortunately, the 25th was not invoked. He certainly could have. It would have been a legitimate time to do it. But I think he, I think he was wise in making the decision that he made, and it, it just kept everybody cool and, and didn't do it. So let's talk about Section 3, though. Section 3 is when the president invokes the 25th Amendment and says, I'm incapacitated or I'm going to be incapacitated, can't fulfill the job. Who can tell me the first time that happened in U.S. history? Come on, just guess. Was it Clinton? Just have fun. Clinton. No. No. He went to surgery. Dave. In the movie Dave? That's a good guess. You're the first person that's ever, that's excellent. That's actually true. Yes. Very good. See, now I was thinking actually of, of, of President Bartlett. Because it was President Bartlett and West Wing in the fifth season that he actually had to hand it over. He had to invoke the 25th. You know what was cool about this episode? You had a Democrat president and a Republican speaker, and no vice president. The vice president had resigned. So the Democrat president had to hand the reins over to a Republican speaker of the House who was going to give up his speakership to take over the reins for just, you remember what happened was his daughter was kidnapped by radical Islamic terrorists, and he, President Bartlett was ready to blow up the entire Middle East, and he said, I can't do this, i got to step aside. And so this Republican, you know, John Goodman played the, uh, played the speaker, and, and um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, um, uh, Jed Bartlett, you know, you see his picture there. What's his name? Sheen. What's his first name? Charles. No, it's the dad. Martin, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Martin Sheen. We don't get the presidents right, but we know who Martin Sheen is, by golly. Okay, so, so Martin Sheen uh, is, the, uh, is the president. He hands the reins over to John Goodman, and John Goodman takes it, gets the job done, and hands it back. I just thought it was, a great, again, a statesman-like episode. Sometimes Hollywood gets it right. And they really, I thought Aaron Sorkin and those guys did a great job on West Wing in, in teaching us about the 25th, almost as good as the 24 producers did. So I like to use Hollywood because it's a good example, but this actually did happen in America. Three times we've had the 25th Amendment invoked, and it was Bush all in the last... Bush one. Bush one was not one of them, but close. Reagan was first, and he went under for two hours, had a colonoscopy, invoked the 25th for those two hours, and then Bush 43 actually twice had colonoscopies and invoked the 25th. So for about two hours each time, Darth Vader was president of the United States. Imagine that. <laughs> so, and I like Dick Cheney and I like Darth Vader. So, you know, if Dick Cheney had just kind of breathed like Darth Vader once in a while, it would have been even better. But I just think that's interesting in the 25th Amendment. So that's, that's kind of how it works. Again, uh, those were, were great examples of, of how our system is designed so well that no one person 
is going to, you know, our, our government's not going to fall apart if one person is assassinated or if one person is, you know, dies or is taken out. Our system is very well designed to not allow that to, to destroy the nation. All right, let's jump forward. We're going to jump into Article 2, Section 2, Paragraph 4, dealing with recess appointments. This is one a lot of people have been asking about, not just with President Obama, but with President Bush. Really, for a long time, uh, both parties have used recess appointments and I think abused them, both parties. It, it, they, they do it too often. The concept for the Founding Fathers was very different than what we do today. Page 26, right in the middle of the page, the President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate. All right, now let's think about that for a second, because a recess, when these guys were in charge, was not a weekend pass. They weren't just flying home for the weekend and coming back. A recess for these guys was a long time. Think about the travel, uh, that, that what it was like for them back then. In fact, even the whole concept of how much time you spent in Washington, D.C. was very different for them than it is for us. In fact, I love Article 1, Section 4 on page 8. Article 1, Section 4, Paragraph 2. I love this. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year. <laughs> We're lucky to get them to come home for once every year, right? Totally different back then. These guys said, hey, we're going to go to D.C., get our business done, and come back home. They didn't want to live in D.C. They didn't want to be there all the time. So you might have had in a two-year Congress these guys coming home for 10, 12 months at a time. So that's a long recess. You can imagine that if a critical position, if that person dies or resigns or whatever, you need that, that relief valve, the power in the executive branch, to fill that vacancy for that long recess. That makes perfect sense. I think these guys were entirely correct and putting that, that in our Constitution. But today, what do we do? Man, Congress goes home for the weekend, and we make recess appointments on the week. And you know what's really bad? Again, both parties doing it. A lot of times, they'll take somebody they've appointed that the Congress is refusing to, that the Senate's are refusing to approve. So that, that you got a languishing appointment sitting there. Senate goes home, and the President goes, oh, while they're gone home, I'm going to push this guy through. That's not what these guys had in mind for a recess appointment. It was designed to take care of an emergency situation, not to sneak through an appointment that you couldn't actually get the advice and consent of from the Senate. So it's a real problem, again, abused by both sides. I think we just got to, even when it's, if it's your guy, if you're, you know, a guy or gal as president, somebody you supported and you like in the White House and you like the appointment that's languishing in the Senate, you should still be willing to say, I don't support that recess appointment because it violates the process. The process has got to again become important to us. It's not good for us to abuse the process just because we're getting the end that we want. The end does not justify the means. That's not the right way to play this game and, and, and govern a country. So recess appointments, real problem. Yes, sir. I'm sure you're aware that the uh, Congress just passed uh, a, a law that eliminated about 160 ratification processes by the Senate. So, in other words, the president can appoint these people without ratification. Have you heard about that? I did not. No, I'm it's not a, aware. It's about 160 different appointments. So that, that passed they, the House and the Senate. Is it done? Uh, or it's just it's well, working? I think, I think it, I'm not sure, but, yeah. it, but it's in effect. I don't know if it was uh, a resolution, maybe, yeah. is all it takes. You know, in my opinion, headed the wrong direction. I mean, let, let, let's look at, there's a proper, there's a proper place for appointments that don't require approval. I mean, let, let's take a look at that. We were, we were on page 26. If you, if you jump up a little bit more on that, on that page uh, right above there, so it talks about the uh, advice and consent in the second paragraph. So he's, he has the power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint, and then he goes through the long list of folks that he appoints. But then the next paragraph says, but the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone in the courts of law or the heads of, of departments. So that's a proper constitutional function for the Congress to pass that law. But the more we do that, the more we're empowering the executive to go run all of these agencies with less and less accountability back to the Congress. And so in my opinion, that's going the wrong direction. We have that separation of powers and those checks and balances for a reason. And, and I, I don't want the president to have any more power in terms of appointing folks that don't have to get some advice and consent. But then again, you know, they may, these may be some low-level positions that they've decided, Congress has decided, it takes too long to, get, to go through the process. I just, I, based on theory, I'm with you. I think that's a, that's a bad idea. But, but they do have, you know, the president does that. You know, a lot of people ask me, what about these czars? Does he have the right to appoint these czars? I mean, it seems like we got more czars than the Soviet Union ever had at this point. Um, he does actually have the power to make some of these appointments that are within an agency that was created by law. So Congress creates an agency, 
And then the president has to go enforce and execute the law. And so if there's appointments within that that don't require Senate approval, he can do that. He can call them czars or whatever. But if Congress doesn't like what he's doing, they can rein him back in by defunding that position or passing a law that says you can't have an unappointed position in that way. So it's kind of a give and take back and forth. We got to remember that that's what the checks and balances are all about. What our challenge today is that most often the executive branch and the legislative branch are not willing to take on the other branches. Everybody just seems to lay down because they're afraid of the fight. It'll look bad in the media and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and what happens is we lose in the long run. The Constitution loses because either the president loses a, a, a legitimate power because the courts pushed, it, you know, pushed on him or the, or the Congress loses a legitimate power because the courts pushed on them or the president pushed on them. It's real important. Anytime a branch is encroached upon by another branch, we'll see a quote a little later by Hamilton on this, for the, the branch that's being encroached upon to push back, to, to protect their authority, their constitutional authority, it's, it's a duty on their part, not, not for the person that's in the position, but for the office itself so that the Constitution continues to work the way that these guys designed it to work. So that appointment process is, is a big part of that and having the Senate uh, be, a, be a piece of that puzzle. So the, 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 the uh, recess appointments is... is um, is a big question today. I did want to point out, though, that we, that we did have the president made a lot of recess appointments recently when the Senate said that they were not in recess and that the House said the Senate was not in recess. And you had, uh, there was a great article, Ed Meese from Heritage Foundation, former Attorney General, did a great article on this. And he pointed out something that I had actually forgotten about. He said, you know, for the president to make these appointments, you remember what happened? The Senate was was gone like every, for every three days they had something that would, a, a process that would kick in so that they were not in recess. They, they were purposely not wanting to be in recess because they didn't want any appointments to take place. And the president appointed a, a bunch of folks. And it was the Labor Relations Board and, and I, I think some judges. I forgot who all got appointed. But there's, there's actually a provision here that Ed Meese pointed out that I had completely forgotten about. And it's back on page 10. It's in Article 1, Section 5 on page 10, right towards the top, third paragraph from the top. It says, Neither House during the session of Congress shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. And he pointed out that the House had not given permission for the Senate to adjourn, to recess for that amount of time. So he, he had a bunch of other stuff in the article as well that backed up the fact that these were unconstitutional recess appointments. Again, I'm not just picking on our current president. I think all presidents over the last few decades have abused this. Now, I think our current president has gone further than any of the others, but the point is recess means something. A recess appointment was a specific idea, an important idea that these guys put in place, and we don't want to lose it. We want the president to have that power. The more a president abuses that power, the more likely Congress is going to sooner or later or we the people are going to take it away. So it's just a bad deal. The way we fix it is for we, for we the people to get educated, start electing leaders that will actually follow that. Executive orders is also one that's been raised a lot lately. The, the idea of executive orders, that's not actually a provision specific in the Constitution that says that the president has the power to, uh, to execute orders. But where it comes from is Article 2, Section 3, Paragraph 3, and that's going to be page 26 and 27 in your book. And it's this phrase, he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And so over time, beginning with Washington, uh, you started having executive orders from the president to make sure that the laws were faithfully executed. That's perfectly fine as long as the executive order is, is executing a law that Congress has actually passed according to the Constitution. So if you've got a, con a law that's been passed by the House and Senate, signed by the President, or allowed to go into law uh, by the President without being signed, not overturned by the court, this is a legitimate law. It creates some agency or some process. The President has to see that that's executed faithfully. Sometimes they have to issue orders about how it's going to be executed. As long as that is within the purview of how the law was passed, it's perfectly fine. So presidents have always done executive orders. I, I think Reagan did I think it was 280 or something like that. Bush had about 300. Um, I, I don't know what the number is on Obama at this point, but they've all done it. The difference is when a president issues an executive order that is not a law passed by Congress. That's a problem. Or when the president issues an executive order that's the exact opposite of what Congress passed as a law. Or let's say that Congress is considering a law, and last year they said no to that law. And this year they might be having it work its way through the committee process. If the, if the president just says, well, I don't care, they're taking too long, I'm going to do it by executive order, that is not the proper constitutional function of an executive order. It's an unconstitutional executive order. And that's why you've heard a lot from members of Congress saying, whoa, 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 this is not right. This is the president acting on its own. This is a very, uh, um, really a tyrannical 
use of power. So that's a real problem as well. Uh, again, many presidents have, have ventured way too far on this issue, and we just keep getting further and further, and I think now we're so far out there, it's a real problem. And I think it's got to be reined in. Congress is the ones, they have to do it. You take, you take these recess appointments. Congress has to push back by standing up and saying, we're not going to approve another appointment until you reverse those appointments. Executive orders that are unconstitutional. We can sue so that I'm sure people are suing and it's going to make its way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court may overturn. They have a couple of times overturned executive orders. Congress needs to stand up and say, we don't agree with that executive order. Here's a law actually reversing it. So these are, these are battles that, again, you've got to have people that are willing to say the Constitution is more important than one party or another party's political agenda. It's always got to be the process has to be defended. The concepts these guys put in place have to be defended. So we're doing the most important part right now. We're getting educated. Now it's our job to go back and help get them educated and choose leaders that will take that oath seriously. All right, we covered a lot of ground there on the presidency, but there was a question about oaths, and it, it reminded me, you actually do a whole talk on mm -hmm. God and the Constitution. There's a CD of that that's going to be included in the, in the package here, so folks can go dive in deep there, and you cover oaths in that a little bit, but give us a little bit of taste of that. How important are those oaths, and how do you get people to uphold them? Yeah, well, the, the way the Founding Fathers believed that you upheld oaths was you were more scared of God than of, of not following your oath. Because if you take an oath of office, nobody really knows if you lied or not, but he does. So that's not about you. If I take my oath, it's not so you hold me accountable to that oath. It's, it's because I know God's going to. God, uh, you, you don't need it. But I'm agreeing with you to give you permission that you nail me if I lie. Yeah. And so what it does is, it, as they said in another document, it binds the conscience in the most strongest ties. It's, it's what gets you up here and says, you know what? I promised God I, I, I can't bring more. You know, yeah. I, I might can do a lot of things with the people and turn my back on them and they wouldn't know I was doing it and whatever. And, and so, because a lot of that stuff does happen behind the scenes. I mean, does. if you're going to hold a public servant accountable, there's going to be times where there's, you know, committee you meetings you don't know what's happening, exactly back deal right. rooms. It's just part of the process. It's going to happen. That's right. You want that person to be thinking about that oath and that conscience. And you will find that in those early state constitutions, including the one written by Ben Franklin, 1776 Constitution of Pennsylvania, it said, you, we don't want you holding office unless you believe there's a future state of rewards and punishments. So if you didn't have faith in an oath, I it, mean, if you didn't think that an oath would hold you accountable, if you didn't believe in God, we don't want you there because we can't hold you accountable in that back now, it, it, deal. It, Rick, if you say, I swear before God I'll do this, you just put a burden on yourself that says, I swore before God. Yeah. But if you say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that, I, I have to trust in your goodness. And maybe you're a good guy, maybe you're not. And so for some political officials, maybe, they're, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But by doing the oath the way they did it, and, and see, there are books out there that are called like the Godless Constitution suggesting that this is all secular stuff. Yeah. You can only say that if you know nothing about history and nothing about what the founders did. So let's take the oath clauses because there are five oath clauses in the Constitution. Oaths are a big deal to the founding fathers. And from their standpoint, there is no such thing as a secular oath. Let me just run you through some of their, their quotes. Okay. James Madison said that an oath is the strongest of religious ties. I'm sorry, secular people may not like that. Uh, oath is a religious tie. Uh, you have here John Adams. John Adams says, oaths in this country are as yet universally considered as sacred obligations. Mm. It's a religious obligation. You have James Iredell. He's a ratifier of the Constitution. He was put on the U.S. Supreme Court by George Washington. And so here's this Supreme Court justice. Here's what he said. He says, according to the modern definition, which modern definition 1788 back then, <laughs> yeah. according to the modern definition of oath, it is considered, and by the way, this was done at the Ratification Convention of the U.S. Constitution of North Carolina. So at the Ratification Convention, he's talking about the oath clauses. And this is according to the modern definition right now today of an oath, 1788, when we ratify this thing. He's in the middle of the debate. He's this isn't some random letter no. later. This is in the middle no. of the debate. Okay. He says, it is considered a, quote, solemn appeal to the supreme being for the truth of what is said by a person who believes in the existence of the supreme being in a future state of rewards and punishments. An oath is, God, I'm saying this, and I know I'm going to have to account to you someday, and I'm cognizant of the fact I'm going to have to account to you, so I'm giving you my word. So if you don't believe in God, then that part doesn't hold any weight. The well, doesn't then, mean then it's on the goodness of man, and, yeah. and uh, there's not a whole lot in me that says the goodness of man is great. Yeah. Just look back across the 20th century and look at about 150 million lives that were lost because Stalin wasn't good, and Hitler wasn't good, and Tojo yeah. wasn't good, and, and Pol Pot wasn't good. And goodness of man, if the goodness of man worked, we wouldn't have a 
prison anywhere in America yeah. because the, it doesn't, you know, and, and that's what the founders knew. So that's James Iredell. You have here Oliver Wolcott, who's a signer of the Declaration. Oliver Wolcott was the governor of Connecticut. Uh, this is what he says. He said, the Constitution enjoins an oath upon the officers of the United States. This is a direct appeal to that God who is the avenger of perjury. Such an appeal to him is a full acknowledgment of his being in providence. Now, he's talking the oaths in the Constitution. He said the oaths in the Constitution, they are a direct appeal to God who's the avenger of perjury. If so how could it be a godless Constitution if these guys are saying right there out of the Constitution? Five, it's a God, yeah. five oath clauses. Wow. They're all five religious clauses. So continue. John Quincy Adams. Uh, and by the way, John Quincy Adams, kind of fun thing to, to know about the advice and consent clause in the Constitution, which John Quincy Adams was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court and confirmed. Now, he wasn't in the country when it happened. They didn't have a hearing on him. But the advice and consent, the Senate knew him. They knew his capabilities. They knew that he is a great guy to have on the court. Uh, but he turned it down because at the time he was negotiating the Treaty of Ghent to end the War of 1812. Wow. So to, to come home and be a Supreme Court justice, he's going to have to leave the country in a lurch because he's trying to bring an end to the War of 1812. He's putting the and country so ahead of his own. He's putting the country ahead of his own ambitions. Yeah. And so he is nominated and confirmed the Supreme Court. So he is another legal guy, a very bright mind. This is what he said. He said, the Constitution had provided that all the public functionaries of the Union, not only the general or the federal government, but also the state governments, should be under oath or affirmation for support. We take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, even if you're a state official. You take an oath to uphold the Constitution. It says, the homage of religious faith was thus superadded to all the obligations of temporal law to give it strength. So he's saying, we've just tied religion to the Constitution to give it strength. This, this is what drives the oath clause home, is we've made it between you and God. Mm. And that's what, so here, here's some more. We're but, just going to keep calling on. Uh, before you do this one, so that, I mean, that's just a reminder to me of the difference between the whole, you know, French Revolution, liberty you without bet. God, and our, our, you know, liberty with God. It's almost like it's the, you know, religion and faith, it, it, it's the glue that's really making all this work, that these pieces wouldn't work so well if you didn't have religion as a part of it, even down to a public servant to a public upholding servant. Their, their oath. Well, you know, you and I, if we go to the moon and breathe there, we'll die because that's not our atmosphere. And if you take a secular atmosphere of the Constitution, it will die because mm. that was not its atmosphere. Yeah. It was birthed and created in a religious atmosphere. And if you try to take that atmosphere, if you take that air out of the room, it will suffocate. It will die because it's not made that way. And here's another good example. Rufus King is a signer of the Constitution. And he said, the oath, in the oath which our laws prescribe, we appeal to the supreme being to deal with us hereafter to as we observe the obligations of our oaths. He said, the pagan world were and are without the mighty influence of this principle which is proclaimed in the Christian system. So here again, the difference between our formula and other formulas, the reason it's worked so well is because in this Christian system we have this mighty influence of accountability to God for those oaths. That's and that's, huge. And that's why in the Declaration, again, of the six principles, number one is there is a Creator. Yeah. And He created you, therefore He can tell you what to do and you'll have to answer to your Creator someday. Mm. So that was the belief. Here's another one, John Witherspoon. Now John Witherspoon, signer of the Declaration, he trained a number of the Founding Fathers as president of Princeton University. This is what he said. He says, an oath is an appeal to God, the searcher of hearts for the truth of what we say and always supposes a calling down of His judgment on us if we lie. Mm. He says, persons entering on public office are obliged to make oath that they will faithfully execute their trust. He said in vows, there's no party but God and the person himself who makes the vow. When you take an oath, it's between two people. It's between you and God. It's not between you and the, the, the nation or anything. It's between you and God. That's what the oath is. He continues, an oath therefore implies a belief in God and His providence and is indeed an act of worship. Wow. You mean the Constitution has five acts of worship? Yeah, it's got a lot more than that. But this is what, I'm telling you, these are the guys that, that did this and helped write this. One final example, George Washington in his farewell address, this is what he says. He says, where's the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation to our oaths? If our oaths become secular and you don't feel like you're counting to God. There's no guarantee there. There's no guarantee. Anything. That's right. And so this thing, how do you get people to observe their oaths? You get them to be cognizant of God. You get them to be aware that they will answer to God. And if they lie to us, the people, they're going to have to deal with God. And this is not one person here. You've gone through the father of the country. You've got signers of the Constitution, okay. signers of the Declaration. I mean, all these huge founding I, I give fathers. you all these legal books. I don't even need yeah. signers. I'll, I'll give the commentaries they wrote afterwards. I'll, give you, I'll, I'll go through their legal I'll go through the court's legal rulings. I mean, this is not like I've concocted something here. This is all over their documents. And this comes straight to that Exodus 1821. They've got to fear God. Now, yeah. those key elements, if they fear God. Able men but, such as fear God, yeah. not one or the other. You need able men who fear God. Yeah, then that oath will mean something. Then the oath Which means, means something. when we're choosing, 
we need to be thinking about the oaths that this person is the oath this person is going to take for their office. It doesn't mean anything unless we choose people that believe in God and so, that actually want to be held accountable. By and God. you better choose people that way because 99% of what they do, as you pointed out, is done in private. Yeah. You know, if you think of 10 to 13,000 bills generally every year that are introduced in the federal Congress, you can probably name five. As yeah, as you, do, do. you don't know half of what's going on. So, well, well, let's take a presidential example in, in terms of what a president, this is Article 2 here in this particular section. So some of the things a president does that absolutely. most people, how about some of those appointments? We had a question on exceptions that don't have to go through the Senate. That's right. So this is going to be an action where nobody's going to be able to hold the president accountable right. to. So the, the founders thought there were some things that you should do that for yeah. and, and have some of those exceptions. But again, that's thinking you're going to have a president in place Who will that's going to uphold that that's oath. That's right. Yeah. The, the, the fact that a recess appointment now means you're gone for three days. On, and by the way, yeah. they went for Christmas and New Year break. And so I'm taking a federal holiday as designated by law, and that's a recess? And yeah. you're going to do national labor? And I'm going to use it to push somebody through? I'm going yeah. to push some. Now, why did the founding fathers do it so that there would be two branches involved in presidential appointments. And by the way, the question was asked, you know, the Congress just passed this law that excluded certain things, and as a general principle, we're, we don't want that. We want them being yeah. accountable. But part of what happens, the reason the, the Founding Fathers did that was also included in presidential appointments until the 1960s was postmasters. Now, postmasters are not going to make or break the United States of America. That's an administrative office. They don't exercise any power. Uh, they, you know, they may be inefficient and incompetent, but that doesn't break the, the nation. Yeah, yeah. So it's not an abuse of power. So in the 60s, uh, Congress passed a law that says, hey, postmasters, let's not have Senate confirmation on them anymore. I mean, that's not a danger. And so what happens is with, with now more than 1,000 agencies, and some say as many as 1,300 federal agencies, the president has thousands of appointments to make. And some of them are just clerical. You know, some of them, they, they don't have decision-making power. They just, they have to execute their duty then that's not really the people you want to confirm. But that's not what happened in these other recess appointments where they're trying to cram people through that the Senate opposed already. Right, those were appointments that really do have a major impact, should not have been snuck that's through right. in a recess appointment. That's right. And so when you look at that, that appointment clause with the advice and consent of the Senate, how come we just don't let the President pick his own guys? And the Founding Fathers answered that. Matter of fact, if you go to the Federalist Papers, the Federalist Papers, that is their commentary on, on, on the Constitution. This is written to help ratify the Constitution. So they're looking ahead to they're how this ahead. thing's going to work. And, and the, the three authors there, you got Madison and John Jay and Alexander Hamilton. Now, here's what they said about why you have two branches involved in a nomination. When you have a nomination that you want somebody to confirm that, here's what it explained. It says, it would be an excellent check upon a spirit of favoritism in the president and would tend greatly to preventing the appointment of unfit characters. Hmm. If he can put in whoever he wants and nobody can say, whoa, yeah. that guy's incompetent. You know, that guy has whatever, that guy's got a criminal record. If you can't have somebody to be a check and balance, then he can run through everybody that is a supporter. He's appointing his here. cousin, his brother-in-law. You betcha, you know, nepotism yeah. comes in. It says, he would be both ashamed and afraid to bring forth from the most distinguished and lucrative stations candidates who had no other merit than that of coming from the same state to which he particularly belonged, mm -hmm. or being some other way personally allied to him, or possessing the necessary insignificance and pliancy to render them ubiquitous instruments of his pleasure. That is just his political hacks. I'm rewarding yeah. my guys, putting them in office, and, and these are my guys, and they're going to care. That's why you have the second branch involved. But that only works because I, I, we still see some of this yep. because the Senate's not doing its job. It's Senate's back to those constitutional arms. You know, if the president's allowed to just put anybody in that they want, then the Senate's falling down on their duty. Well, the Senate says, you know, the president won the election. With that, he, he wants yeah, to Yeah, I've right. heard that, yeah. No, you didn't take an oath to uphold the election. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution. The Constitution. That's right. And that's a whole, and unless you, again, worry that you're going to have to answer to God for what you do, then why not just rubber stamp anything he yeah, wants? Yeah. But if you have to answer to God for upholding the Constitution and protecting the liberties of the people, now you're a whole lot more independent from anything that any party wants or anything that any, any person wants. Here's another one. Roger Sherman, one of the, the, the six guys who signed the Declaration and the Constitution, actually, he's called a master builder of the Constitution. He's the guy who came up with the bicameral system, the House and Senate, which then we used in the Electoral College. And so he, he's got now, so Now, when you things. use that phrase, master builder, does that mean that they, they came up with major components? Is that Well, master what? builder is you had 55 guys there, and some were yeah. a whole lot more active than others. Okay. And some, you know, we often call James Madison, the father of the Constitution, which is kind of nonsense because he has a letter said, you can't call me that. He, he said, said, don't call me he that. Said, he, <laughs> well, they said, they said that he more than any other had, and he said, no, no, no. He said there were a lot of minds. And so what, what historians used to say was that you have Roger Sherman, you have George Washington, you have Charles Pinckney, and actually Charles Pinckney nobody talks about. 
the Constitution looked closest to all the things he proposed. He's the guy who got it wow. most right for what the people chose. But you have you have James Madison, George you see Washington. His, you see his fingerprints you in see really his more fingerprint. than anybody else's. And, and Sherman's one of the guys. You yeah. can see his fingerprints in the electoral college and the bicameral system. Others. I mean, he had what he came up with. The other guys liked, and, and they included a lot of it. So. That's why we call him Master Bill. Now we call we call Madison now the father of the Constitution because in 1946 they discovered an unknown manuscript of Madison where he went through and trashed religion. All the things he'd done as president and in the first Congress, he said, you know, I, I'm the guy who voted for the appointment of chaplains in Congress. I really wish I hadn't done that. Wow. I wish we didn't have chaplains. So he reversed. He reversed. Yeah. And, but it was a private, it was private, it was secret. Nobody, ever, no founder ever read it. Nobody knew it was there until they found it in 1946. And suddenly he's the father of the Constitution. Oh, now yeah. they want him because now he's, he's saying things later yeah. against what. Yeah, and, so, and, and those were things he did out of office, private. Oh, yeah. That, this instead was of paying attention later, to what he did as a representative of the people. His actions were very clear. I mean, as President of the United States, I think he had eight or ten or twelve proclamations calling for days of prayer and fasting. Yeah. And he says later in old life, I wish I hadn't done any of that. And so he goes through and just repudiates himself. I mean, mm. he's yeah. just double-minded in this stuff. And, and so rather than looking at what he did and who cares what he believed individually because the other founding fathers set up laws and stuff that, that were different, now we say his personal opinion later in life that no one ever knew Because it fits had, their agenda. That's, that's exactly the only reason. That's yeah. exactly it. So Madison did have an impact on the Constitution, no question, but he's one of many. Well, you take well, Roger That's Sherman. why I love your approach. You step back and you say, we're going to look at all these guys. That's right. We're going to learn from all of them. And here's another one that most people hadn't heard of, and he's a master builder. He's a master builder. And so in talking about why it is that the Senate advises consensus of president or nominees, this is what he said. He said, if the president alone was invested with the power of appointing all officers and was left to select a council for himself, he'd be liable to be deceived by flatterers and pretenders to patriotism who would now have no other motive but their own profit and their own self-seeking gain. He says, we can help recognize and flush out some of these guys that are, that are just mere people looking for their own profit. I, you know, I want to build my resume. I want to, he said, we can help make sure you get people in there who are willing to serve. Because there's accountability there's from accountability. another branch. It's not just one person doing it on their and own. And then finally, Justice Joseph Story, who's put on the court by President James Madison, and he did the famous commentary on the Constitution. People want to buy a good book on the Constitution. You can buy that reprinted 1833 commentaries on the Constitution. There is one that's called The Familiar Exposition of the Constitution. It's one volume. His actual work was three volumes long. And it's, it's very thorough. It goes through every clause of the Constitution, and it's, it's great. But in his commentaries on the Constitution, this is what he said. He says, the consciousness of this check will make the president more circumspect and deliberate in his nomination for office. If he knows that he has to get him by somebody who's watching, he's going to be a lot better in his choices. Yeah. And that's why we have the advice and consent clause. And so the question about, you know, what happens when Congress takes some out, well, if they're postmasters and that kind of stuff, you don't worry about it. But the reason they were put there in the first place is to make sure we don't get bad folks heading government agencies. Accountability. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, abuses of power. we talked about things that get done in private, so you want to have people you can trust. It's time to talk about the courts because we see a lot of things being yeah. done in terms of no accountability with the courts. And in our next chapter, we're going to dive into the courts in Article 3. We're going to learn about some myths of the judiciary. But before you go to that section, be sure and watch that little clip with Brad Stein where we talk about the Electoral College, the World Series of Politics. When we come back here on Constitutional Live with David Barton and Rick Green.